Hey, everybody. I am here today with this amazing woman named Brenda Florida. Brenda Florida is a life coach. And she says, live lavishly. The art of transformation is how she does her work. And she lives her life that way. Mm. I can attest to that because Brenda and I met about one year ago, I believe, through Dr. Joe Dispenza Friends and Family. And we have been working together with each other. So she's been coaching me and I've been doing sessions with her pretty much uh, for one year. And mm -hmm. if you really want to get to know somebody, that's a great way to do it, right? <laughs> it sure is. Because I think we know each other really, really deeply. I think there is nothing you don't know about me. <laughs> <laughs> and you have seen me at my worst for sure, for yeah. sure. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, she's an amazing coach, mm, uh, living an amazing life, doing all kinds of things. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And I am Kai Shanti, and this is the Conscious Interview Series, where I interview amazing people living conscious lives. And I'm going to read a little bit about Brenda here, so you hear a little bit about her background. So she was married at 18 to her childhood sweetheart. They had four kids by the time she was 26. They had a successful business and sold it the same year their fourth child was born. She says, in hindsight, that was the beginning of the end of their marriage, but it took 10 more years to actually get divorced. She says, I had no idea who I was. I was raised in a fundamental evangelical culture where women were supposed to make everyone happy, especially their husbands. They had no value or purpose other than that. <laughs> Lovely, right? <laughs> yes, it was great. <laughs> She was also sexually abused as a little girl and repressed that memory until her mid-30s. So I, I like to talk maybe a little bit about how that came forward. By the mm -hmm. time she was 40, she was divorcing for a second time and awakening sexually and spiritually at a deeper level than ever before. But her life was still caught in a lot of old patterns, so she kept getting into jobs and relationships that stifled the truth of who she was. Last June, she left her, and that would be the June before this June, this past June, so a little over a year. Yeah, just yeah. a little over a year, yeah. Last June, she left her last job and began a full-time pursuit of her business as a life coach. That journey has called her much deeper than she ever imagined into the truth of who she is and how she expresses and lives that truth in the world. She says, my deepest joy is in helping others heal from the patterns that keep them separate from their truth. And I can attest to that because I see her spirit and her joy when working with me personally and excitement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hi, Brenda. Hi. So Welcome. happy to be here with you. I'm, I'm super so excited. glad to have you here. <laughs> I've been talking about doing this for a while, and this is the perfect moment. Yes, it is. So the way that I do these interviews is I tap into my higher consciousness, and I ask the questions from that space. So I'm just going to close my eyes for a moment, and we'll start. So, Brenda, when you were young, mm -hmm. say around 14, can you go back to 14? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. When you were about 14, what was calling you most in life? So, we want to get the basis of you. Mm. What were you feeling the most? What were you wanting the most? What were you experiencing the most? Well, my parents had just we're just getting divorced okay. uh, this is so interesting that you just asked me this <laughs> uh, um and it was terrible because my parents did the classic do not do this to your children uh move of sort of <laughs> like i had to go to my mom's camp and be on her side and my oldest sister went to my dad's side and you know he was all right my mom was all wrong and my little sister, unfortunately, kind of got lost in the shuffle because she was too young to try to play that game. 
uh, and so my mother would literally have me answer the phone if my dad was calling or if she answered and it was him, she would hand me the phone and have me tell him Mm. her demands or what she was mad about. My dad had an affair. They'd been married 20 years. My dad had an affair with his very adorable 20 years younger, you know, secretary, very classic sort of thing. And um, so that was, that was a very dark time in my life. Um, lots of high drama. You know, my mom would pull again, this fundamental evangelical, I call it, we were usually Baptist, but it doesn't, not all Baptists or fundamentalists, you know, right. but um, she would pull me into her room at night, to, you know, and we'd be on our knees beside her bed, praying and crying that my dad would come back. And, you know, mm -hmm. all this drama that as an adult, I think, holy shit, right. why did she have her 14 year old daughter, you know, sucked into all that, but whatever. Uh, from the joyful side of things, especially when I was a teenager, I used to sing a lot. Mm. In fact, I always wanted to be a professional, you know, singer, performer. And um, a few, some school things, like I was always in the school choir. So when we did, you know, programs and stuff, I would do solos and things. So that's probably where I got my most, you know, joy was from singing and thinking of myself in that kind of a, life as an adult, you know, being a performer, traveling a lot, you know, all that good stuff. All right. And so at this point in your life, looking back over those years that have passed, have you expressed yourself? Do you feel like you've expressed yourself in that way? Have you come to that expression in your heart? I, yeah, I mean, I think, so I sang a lot until I was in my thirties. Um, and then I didn't sing so much, but and I don't mean this in a shallow way at all, but I feel like what I do in my work now is expressing that. So, so to say it's a performance to be a life coach sounds shallow and silly, but it's, there's something about the way, you know, when you're really performing from the heart you're showing up and you're just giving the essence of who you are whether it's through you know singing or you know whatever it is and that's what I do and it's probably why you know I do a lot of videos like you do mm -hmm. and you know Facebook lives and things like that and it of course I love it I love being seen I love you know being in front of a camera I'm very comfortable in that arena Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, I mean, I think that without thinking of it that way, uh, I probably am expressing that. All right. And so your is your ultimate goal to be in front of a crowd of people? Yeah. yeah. Expressing and yes. Yes. I, what, what, how would you see that? I would love. So I love this combination of like, I think I'll call it inspirational teaching. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like te there's a certain amount of teaching that just like you teach me about how to connect, you know, to my higher consciousness and live from there and all those things. Like there's a certain amount we need to be inspired to be on this path and taught how to do it. And then I have this super pragmatic part that doesn't want to leave it at a concept. Oh, let's live consciously. Okay. <laughs> so when the, when the bills are due and there's not enough money or somebody's sick or so, you know, then how do I do it? Like, I want to know how to really do it. You know, right. I, I'm super pragmatic in that way. So I love helping. I love bringing that to people. So I see it in sort of that sort of combination. I would love to be on a big stage, lots of people in the room and do this combination of teaching and very practical. Now, how do I make this work in my life? Yes. That yes. gap, the, the whole concept that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And so how do we, I don't know if manage is the right word, but how do we do that? You know, how do we do those two things? Cause they're not the same. Right. You know, and so that's what, that's what I, that's how I see that now. Okay. And you feel that you are definitely living your life in that way now? 
oh, yes, <laughs> even, <laughs> even when it hurts. <laughs> I am so, I, the, the best word I can use to describe it is driven. It really <laughs> is just like a drive I can't turn off. It's not something I can explain. Oftentimes it makes no rational sense, <laughs> but I just have to keep going for it. Mm -hmm. And what is it in your heart that wants to keep going, that wants to keep pushing, that wants to keep doing it? So I have, and of course, in my late 20s, after my fourth, about two years after my fourth child was born, and our marriage and our finances were all kind of spiraling down. I got very depressed and I started seeing a therapist that I worked with off and on and more on than off for 20 years, probably. She was oh, wow. awesome. And, and she became a Jungian uh, analyst. So she was a big fan of Carl Jung and studied in his school and da da da. And so we did great work together. And so I would have worded it a little differently, you know, in that part mm -hmm. of my journey. Uh, but it's the same thing that now I will call <laughs> this drive to really live from a place of knowing there's no separation, mm. right? Everything's one. It's all oneness. Right. That everything that's happening, you know, to me, to others in the world is for our good. And I am worthy, like mm -hmm. with no performance, no question marks, no doubt, like being so tapped into who I am as that divine being that even though I'm having a human experience, I never lose touch with that wholeness and oneness and, you know, worthiness and that every single thing is happening for me, for us. So that's a really palpable experience. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I have it. I, I mean, I, I have it at times. I have it sometimes for days. And then, you know, I still have things that bump me out of it. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. as we all do. But I think that the moment that you're coaching someone, mm -hmm. the moment that you're on stage, the moment that you're in front of the camera, which is that performance feeling, that's when it all clicks into gear, just like right now. Yes, so absolutely. We can palpably feel your teachings and your experience mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. and yes, so thank that's, you. That's shared. We feel really like intensely now that that's just being shared out in the world. Mm. So you're allowing people to feel that. Yeah. Yeah. It is very palpable to me. Like I, you know, right now, whenever I'm in my zone of doing this work, that's how it feels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In your zone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what brought you to this point in your life? So maybe talk about your first marriage, the depression that happened during your first marriage, when it was revealed to you that there was sexual abuse as a child. How did those things evolve you into where you are now? Yeah, so I, so my husband also, like we met at church, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, that was our lives. And so he had very similar, you know, kind of fundamentalist, very conservative, um, you know, upbringing. And so, of course, well, maybe not, of course, but we were virgins when we got married. Of course, I was only 18, but whatever. Right. <laughs> you know, lots of girls. Even, you know, I graduated high school in 1979. So there's still lots of girls in 1979 that didn't have their virginity. Right. I did. Um, and so we you know, really two virgins that know nothing about sex is not the great way to have a good <laughs> sexual experience, right. you know, but like we didn't know it. Right. Sex is that thing where like, so you're just supposed to magically know how that works. <laughs> right. You know? So like on our wedding night and I'm all excited. I can tell, I know myself well enough at that point to know 
I'm a very sexual person. I'm very, tur- I always love flirting. I'm very easily turned on and all that. So I'm just thinking this is going to be the best, right? Right, right. And it was the worst. Oh, no. <laughs> um, it was the worst. And not to like blame my oh. husband, but like he knew nothing. So he's just oh. like, uh, and like no foreplay. Like, let's just get oh. that in there. And, you know, and it was, it was just horrible oh. anyway. So we started out on the wrong foot. Mm. And we kind of never recovered from that. Oh. And it was funny because, and we were married 16 years, but um, we got into a, I was always willing to take the blame. Plus that was, you know, my role, right? As the woman, everything's my responsibility. And it was me saying, I don't want to have sex. So of course I'm the one to blame. And so we That's, fell into that habit as married people do. It doesn't have to be about sex, but it could be anything. You just get in a habit of, well, this is your fault or this is my fault or whatever. And we just get stuck there. And along the way, there were times that my, how repulsive sex was to me was so strong that I would think like this feels to me how I think somebody who was raped would feel about sex. Like it felt so violating. Okay. Mm -hmm. But of course I couldn't make any sense out of that because I had no memory of my experience. And so, you know, there's a lot of things psychologically we could tie in here and they all tie in for how, because of the lack of emotional intimacy, our physical intimacy was in a way when we did have sex was in a way a violation Right. you know, of me and I'm violating myself over and over by even making myself do, you know, so there's that, right. you know, in the background. But what happened was one night after, you know, I, because every now and then I'd just get tired of saying no. And I'd say, mm-hmm. yes, you know? Um, and right after we had sex, I was kind of like going, you know, dozing off, going to sleep. And I just, almost like it was a dream, but it was too lucid. I wasn't asleep. It was too lucid to really be a dream, but it had that kind of quality in it. And I just saw myself. This was more like, you know, outside of my body looking down. I saw myself as a little girl, probably around five ish being, you know, on my back and this man on top of me. Mm. And that's really at that point that's about all i saw i've mm-hmm. since then gotten a little more actually more visceral aspects of it like i can feel you know if i think about it i can feel his hands on my body i don't know if he penetrated me i'm not sure exactly what happened uh and i don't know who it was i've never recovered any other memory other than the feeling of it in my body mm-hmm. on my body so that was like totally freaked me out. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know. And so but I was I was in therapy with this woman Kathleen and so you know great I brought that to my next session and and my husband you know is not a total jerk like he I told him mm-hmm. and he was very you know, she, she had us like, just agree that for, I don't know what amount of time, the next six months or something, we wouldn't have any sex to just sort of give me time to start, you know, processing through it, whatever. And he was fine with that. Like he's not a total jerk or anything. Right. Um, so I started healing, you know, from that and it made a lot of things make sense. And, um, you know, it's a deeply, it's a deeply impactful experience. It's a big trauma. Right. You know, so it has its own little tentacles that go out into all sorts of things, but I don't think it was per se more impactful, say than other things that the whole female culture in in the, you know, Mm -hmm. church I grew up in of women just really, not that they said it that way out loud, but that women just really didn't have any value other than to make other people happy. That was okay. pro- that was at least as damaging, you know, yes. to, as the sexual abuse. But 
you know, the sexual abuse certainly has shaped me. And when I said, you know, in the little bio that you read, after my second divorce when I was 40, because I still had, you know, so I'm married, I'm a virgin, I'm married to one guy, I date one guy and have sex with him, and then I get married. You know, right. so now I'm on my third partner in life. And <laughs> um, that was a debacle. And we only stayed married two years. And then I just kind of, you know, went wild. I was 40. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't, a te- I wasn't a teenager or a college kid having fun when I was young. I was having mm-hmm. babies, doing all these serious, you know, opening businesses and doing all these serious things. And so I did that when I was in my 40s. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun. And I just thought, I'm going to quit making sex so serious. Like, what if it could just be fun? Mm. What if it really painful experience? What if I could transmute it, so to speak, and let it be fun? And it changed everything for me. Mm-hmm. So in bringing that experience into your life now, the fun of it, where has that taken your work? Well, I've experimented a lot. Like I love the idea of helping women heal from whatever sexually. It doesn't have to be abuse. It could just be any kind of repression. You know, all mm-hmm. women get so much baggage around sex. And I think that Sex is such a huge way, and this can happen easily to men too, but that we give our power away. Like it's kind of a setup for, well, now you're supposed to please me, right? We're having sex, so you're going to give me my orgasm. You're going to, you know, right. and, or I need you to do that. It's a, just a real uh, trap for giving your power away. Mm-hmm. And so I love the idea of helping women and men get past that to really liberate themselves, whatever that means for them. You know, it doesn't, it, do, it looks different for everybody, but to really liberate themselves into the, the freedom of their own sexual expression. Yes. Know, whatever that is. And I think most of us are not uh, liberated to that. I think most people don't feel free they don't even know what that means probably to express themselves sexually, you right. know, and the truth of who they are. So I've dabbled with trying to use my work to talk about that. You know, I did a series for a while on, and it's still sitting there on YouTube, a, uh, a Q and a thing I called um, cues for the queen. That, and I've done the sex queen thing. And, now I'm doing a series I'm calling Living Orgasmically, and I'm just using orgasm as a metaphor for life. So I'm always trying to tie it in. There's not been, a, I've never gotten a lot of traction from it. So I just kind of take that as maybe the timing isn't quite right or, uh, you know, whatever. Well, I want people to hear this because I think it's really important to tie this into our life in general, like you're doing with 100 Days of Living Orgasmically. Yeah, but I mean, it's not a, it's not a separate part of our lives. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. In one of my videos the other day, I go on my, especially these Living Orgasmically, they're like four, five, six minute long videos. And I pretty much, I mean, I know what my topic is, but it's not like I'm scripting myself out. And so as I was talking on my video the other day, or maybe this was in cocktails and coaching. Anyway, I just heard myself say, (laughs) you know, we tend to think we have a problem at work, okay? Or maybe we have a problem in a primary relationship or we have a problem with our kids or whatever. And it's like, it's this isolated, compartmentalized thing. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, and and of course, that's what drives us usually to seek help. You know, people hire me as a coach. They're struggling. Yeah, hopefully. (laughs) They're struggling in their relationship. They're struggling with their career. They just got fired. You know, something's Mm -hmm. happened like that. Okay. But what people don't realize usually going into it is once they work on that area, it's going to ripple out into every area of their life because we are not compartmentalized beings. Right. So when I'm if I'm shut down or not expressing myself in a way that's true for me, that's, you know, in alignment with the truth of who I am sexually, even though I don't, I may not realize it at all. Mm -hmm. It's affecting my work. It's affecting my friendships, my primary relationship. If I have one, you know, or how I date and you know, all that, if I don't, um, 
you know, it, it affects everything the same way the other things, if I'm not expressing myself professionally right. in a way that really holds it true to who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm just doing the job because it's a good salary and it's got benefits and I'm t- playing it safe, you know, or that's what's expected of me, you know, whatever yes. the story is. Yes. And I need, you know, that's rippling out into other areas of my life. So we're not compartmentalized. And I love the idea of using our sexuality as a gateway yes. to all the others. Yeah. Well, I love that. It, it's funny. I was walking today and <laughs> I didn't even tie this in. I was thinking of different people I know and how they do different things and just watching people work out at the gym mm-hmm. and saying, oh, that person's probably not a real great lover because they do this, this, and this that way. Uh huh. <laughs> so I think it very much ties in yes. to everything. Yes, yes, yeah. So, I mean, I would be very happy to be on that stage and be talking about, you know, using our sexuality as a gateway I love to this. liberating ourselves in every area of our lives. Yeah. I, I yeah. absolutely love this. And I absolutely love your story. And I think that we have these experiences when, our, when we're young so mm-hmm. that we can open up and express this. Yeah. Do you feel that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, more and more, I'm sure some of this is age, but it's, it's age combined with doing so much of my own deep work. There's just like almost, I don't know what there is that I can't relate to, you know, mm-hmm. not because I've had every experience, mm-hmm. but I've had something similar enough that I can relate to. Like, I just don't think any, you know, pretty judgment free because I know what I can relate to what that feels like. Your story may be different from the, experiences Mm -hmm. but there will be that place in me where I can totally relate to what that feels like Mm -hmm. and that's that piece where you know cliche-ish a little bit as it has become is still so true which is that there is more that connects us than that divides us yes because we all have experienced maybe you haven't been sexually abused but you've had some sort of frightening, humiliating, super confusing, super confusing. You know, why is somebody I trust doing something that feels like it violates me? Mm-hmm. And, but they're telling me it's okay. Or, or, you know, like all these confusing messages, it doesn't have to be through a sexual trauma. It could be through something totally different, but we've all experienced that. And I very much get that from your coaching that when I bring something up, like you said, even if you haven't experienced it or you're not in that same place, you energetically can feel what's happening with me and you know where to dig and you know where to go and you know the question to bring up, to bring up what needs to be seen in the moment. Mm. Thank you. Um, Yeah, I, I think that's just... I can't say I know how I do that. <laughs> it's just how I, but, but it is that, yeah, it's almost like seeing, I don't literally visually see it like a, you know, like a kaleidoscope or, a, you know, mm-hmm. a pattern, but intuitively I can usually pick up on what's behind the scenes, right? Like there's the, symptom of the problem Mm -hmm. and then there's the actual problem you Mm -hmm. know the cause what's causing it and so for me for myself I mean this was my passion in my own work long before I ever became a coach but as a coach definitely my passion with people if they want to is to get below the symptom figure out what the cause is and then heal that Mm. Now, not everybody's ready to go there. And I don't push people. I don't feel like it's my job as a coach mm-hmm. to take you somewhere you don't want to go. Mm-hmm. Okay? So I'm, I'm, you know, I play with that intuitively too. And I might suggest something to a client and you can feel when, when they aren't ready to go there, even if it's 
super obvious to me, <laughs> right. you know, but it's like, okay, like I'll, I'll plant the seed. I'll put out a feeler. And if right. they're just like, no, uh, uh-uh, not, no, I'm that's not how I, then it's just like, okay, honey, like you're just not ready. And it's not my job to make you ready. That's, that's not my job. Right. Yeah. So if I were to, if I were a new person seeing this, seeing this interview and wanting, feeling called to work with you, mm-hmm. what could I expect? What, and what would our initial meeting be? What could I expect? Yes. Well, of course. So I start with like a 15 minute, you know, discovery call thing where, cause I want to get some sense. I don't believe I can work with everyone. <laughs> okay. um, I do believe I'm fortunate. I think I'm, this is a fortunate thing. Um, most marketers do not, but anyway, um, that the way I work with people and the sort of methods you could call it my, my coaching toolkit has tools in it that help with every scenario. So mm-hmm. there's not a problem you can have that I couldn't help you with, so to speak, you know, like I don't just work with people that are struggling at work, you know, or just people who are struggling in a relationship, whatever, like a lot of people do because niching is easier from a marketing perspective. So we do this 15 minute call so I can just sort of hear where you're most frustrated, where you're most drained, you know, things like that to start to get a sense of you and get my own intuitive hit on whether or not we can work together. And then of course uh, the, the person I'm talking to, I'm expecting them to do the same because if for some reason, you know, they're not feeling comfortable, that doesn't work. Um, and then at the end of that call, I pretty much know, and I'll tell the person whether or not I feel like I can help them. Or if I, if I don't, then I would, you know, if I could think of somebody I could refer them to, I would, you know, do that. And then we dive in. I have a, you know, a little questionnaire that asks people things about their background. Cause I like to be able to read some of your story mm-hmm. so we don't have to talk through your whole story. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause that can be very time consuming. Right. And one of the things I like about coaching versus the, ther- you know, the traditional sort of therapeutic, even in a union uh, analyst sort of way, analysis way, those are very time consuming sort of slow processes. There's a lot of, you know, going back to your childhood and da 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 to figure out all the whys. And sometimes that's just not necessary, you know, oh, okay. mm-hmm. or, it, it, or it will just come out in a real organic way. Right. And, so I just like to know some of that because what I want to know is what, where you're stuck or where you're hurting now. Right. And then let's get you out of that. And yeah, getting you out of that might mean we go dip in to the past. But if I've kind of read what your family was like, if, you know, if you've been married, divorced, da, 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 that start, that gives me, you know, a little sense of a bigger sense of who you are. And then, you know, we just, Sometimes we stay, you know, most people come in with a problem (laughs) that they, you know, want Mm -hmm. to fix. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's what we do. And then other times it just grows into opening up other doors and they realize there's nothing to fix. And that what it really is about is having a guide and a objective or I'll use the word objective for right now. Cause I can't think of a better one person to help you in your journey. I'm not invested in what you're doing. I'm not in your life. I have no agenda for you. Mm-hmm. All I'm doing is tuning in to what I'm seeing in you and, and my, how I see the truth of who you are and mirroring that to you. Right. right? And then seeing, and then, if, if you're ready for it, if the person's ready, that mirror is usually enough. Then they, it's like, oh, I, I see how you're seeing me. I like that, right? Mm-hmm. And, then, and then helping them figure out, again, the practical things, just like why I keep coming back and working with you. It's not like three sessions and I'm done. Not that everybody needs to stay, you know, for a year. But, you know, it, we're not, I haven't arrived. There's not this place we get to. It's like, okay, I need no help in my life now. You know, so so some people I work with for, you know, a half a dozen sessions or something and they get over their problem and that's enough for them. And then other people stay with me, you know, longer, you know, come in once a month or something for, you know, checking in and just staying, staying on track. 
But if you think about it compared to the old therapy system, mm-hmm. like you said, you were with your therapist for how long? Yeah, like 20 years. Therapist for 15, 20 years. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't regret a single moment or a single dollar, even though, I mean, half the time when I first started seeing her, we had no money. We had sold our business and lost most of what we had in another business. And, you know, we've got these four kids and goodness knows those kids needed shoes all the time. Like you just can't keep four, eight feet in shoes, you know? (laughs) And um, we were fighting all the time about money. And so then I say, I want to go see a therapist and right. you know, he's just like, no. And, and I, and I remember saying, listen, if I had a brain tumor, mm. we would not be asking, can I afford to go to the doctor? And to me, this is as important as if I had a brain tumor. Yes. Thank you. That's important. And so I spent the money lots of times over those years. Some of those years I was, you know, very, Uh, abundant financially and it was no big deal to pay for it. And other parts of those years, it was on my credit card and I had no way to pay it, (laughs) you know, whatever, because I had, I knew we just don't have to do it alone. And we, I have grown so much deeper, so much faster because I've chosen to work with you than had I had gone through the last year without working with you. Right. And I think that's so important for people to know, because even when you talk about the brain tumor, if you choose not to approach the things that might seem smaller, mm-hmm. well, they are going to build up and turn into yes. something bigger. Yes. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just having, you know, it's your own little advocate, you know, advocate person that you can just go to that's always going to be objective, that's always that just won't have the filters for you that anybody else who knows you has. Mm -hmm. You know, I can tell you things and I have, you know, when I am just in my darkest moments and I've had, you know, absolutely some, at some points in this last year, I've experienced darkness like I more intense than I ever have in my whole life. Well, I'm not going to go to my, adult kids with that, or even my best friend, really, like, there's just something that's like, because Mm. even, even when I'm in it, at least for me, and and this isn't always the case, but anyway, when I'm in it, like, I know that's not who I am, and I'm gonna get out of it, but it's dark, right, and so I don't want to bring my best friend into that, then she's just gonna, Mm. that's gonna just create a whole thing where she's going to be worried about me and da 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 and then I and then you kind of have to deal with that right and then you got them and then they're checking in and uh, and it's so much cleaner with a coach or with you you know because you can know like you're not you don't respond we don't respond to people that way right you know we care about what they're going through but it's not the same I don't know how to describe that but it's not the same thing Right. That's a really beautiful point. So it's a really safe place to just go be your blah, whatever you are. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're just going to be with you. You know, that's. It's kind of like a midwife. Yeah. That's a great metaphor. Yeah. Somebody just to be there with you and yes, coach you through it, you know, Mm -hmm have when when you don't have the energy for a resource (laughs) yeah you know they can show up and hand you that resource you know and they're not energetically or emotionally invested yes just there to help you (laughs) yes yes yeah 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 Yeah. i love that that's that's great okay so if you were to enliven your life to be on the stage now right living your life on this stage where do you want to go what do you want to do? Oh, Tell me all about I, it. I love to travel. So I just want to go everywhere. You know, like a, a, I'd go plenty of places in the U.S. Anybody who wants to call me and book me, we can talk about that later awesome. today. <laughs> yes. Um, and anywhere all over the world. Like I, I love Europe. I love Par- Paris. Is just one of my favorite places ever. You know, so I, yeah. I can't, yeah, I just want to, I want to go places and connect with people. 
Awesome. You know, and do other, because the other thing I'd really like to do is a little different than a stage, but, or just a smaller one, is I really want to do retreats. Mm -hmm. I love how it helps us to really get away from our lives yeah. and, and take time, you know, several days a week to only work on ourselves, you know, just to be that, Absolutely. that greedy with it, you know, and just be like, everything else is shut out. And, and yeah, I'm going to have to go back to that. But for now, I don't have to. And I think it provides such a great, you know, stage environment for taking big leaps in our growth and in our connecting to the truth of who we are by yep. taking that time away and getting rid of all the other distractions. Yes. And I think that we've provided enough of a platform for people to see how trustworthy you are in that environment. Mm. So they can come because people need to really come and trust. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I, that's a great point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're a yeah. person that people can just trust with like the midwife. Mm hmm. Where you can just open up and trust and be yeah. with Brenda in that. Yeah. So I yeah. see all that opening up for you. I'm really excited. Please call Brenda for <laughs> any of these things. Thank you. She's so amazing. Your YouTube channel, subscribe mm -hmm. to her YouTube channel. Watch what she's doing. She's right in the middle of the 100 days mm -hmm. of living orgasmically. And she mm -hmm. has so much good information on there your website. So I'll put a link to the YouTube channel. Okay. In the description and your website address is what? It's my name. So it's brendaflorida.com. Okay. And your Facebook group where she has things that she only does on her Facebook group, yes. like cocktails and coaching where she brings people on every Wednesday, uh, has a cocktail and has fun coaching and discussions with different. Yeah. Guests. And yeah. That's been a lot of fun. And, but you need to be a member of her, her yeah. private group, which is called, go ahead. Live La so the private Facebook group is called Live Lavishly, The Art of Sustainable Transformation. Now, probably if you just put Live Lavishly in the search field in Facebook, that would be enough to get you there. But the rest of it is The Art of Sustainable Transformation. Because okay. that's what I'm, I love that idea of, oh, it's not an idea, but the experience of, you know how when something changes and you just know like, okay, yes, I'm, n I'm not going back, you know, yes. and that's what I want to help people get to mm. not, can I go to the gym and work out in January? Mm. You know, <laughs> will I still be there in August or whatever, you know, that when we make change in our life that is sustainable mm -hmm. and that is really a transformation because you can't sustain it you know, that it's a little bit of a paradox or an oxymoron or a something, because if you can't sustain it, to me, it's not really transformation. You've just mm -hmm. traded one habit for another for a while mm -hmm. until something bumps you off of that. And, you know, then you're back. But I love the idea of helping people actually transform in a way that now what tripped them up before isn't tripping them up. Mm hmm you know, and that connection or whatever it is they're after, you know, is, is a long-term thing. Yeah. Permanent. Yeah. Yeah. It's done. The old pattern is it's done. done. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you would like to add? Oh, I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will add my gratitude to, you know, everyone who listens to this who took the time to listen to this to you Kai and your work and the beauty of it and just the way that the way it's impacted my life it, it has been incredibly significant and the way it impacts the world and the way that everybody who's listening to this can take you know what Kai is doing and really apply it in a really practical, you know, way. 
Because Thank what's you. the point otherwise, you know? What's we, the point? Of, well, that's yeah. true. It's not just this concept of being conscious. Oh, I want to be conscious. I want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, great. Um, you know, so when the demons are running around in your head, now what do you do? <laughs> right. You know, and that's part of why I love your work. Well, your work too. I think that's where we both shine. Yeah, yeah. Call me when the demons are running around. Yes, and I do. Like <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I was like, okay, I'm not intimidated. Bring on the demons. Bring them on. Yeah, I eat and demons I for breakfast. Both of our paths <laughs> mm -hmm. have really allowed us to be able to to work in that way. Yes, we both yeah. had so much of that in our past. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, love. I love you right. so much. Oh, I love you too. Thank you so much for having me. Mm. And I'll have all of Brenda's information posted below in the description. And um, please contact her. She's so amazing. Thank right. you. Mwah. <laughs>